On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. Thomas Henry Huxley, who lived between 1825 and 1895, was an English biologist and anthropologist specialising in comparative anatomy. He is widely known as Darwin's Bulldog because of his advocacy of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. The stories regarding Huxley's famous debate in 1860 with Samuel Wilberforce were a key moment in the wider acceptance of evolution and in his own career, although historians think that the surviving story of the debate is a later fabrication. Huxley had been planning to leave Oxford on the previous day, but after an encounter with Robert Chambers, the author of Vestiges, he changed his mind and decided to join the debate. Wilberforce was coached by Richard Owen, against whom Huxley also debated about whether humans were closely related to apes. What happened next was one of the most famous academic punch-ups in British zoological history. And you know what, I've never really admitted this before, but I've always been rather jealous of dear old Charlie Darwin. He had somebody who would go into battle for him and put the boot in while he could be remaining back, being a gentleman on the sidelines, while Huxley was basically being an academic football hooligan. Well, I'm afraid the title of Danza's Bulldog is already taken. But something happened in this last few days, which means that I now hereby announce that the CFZ Facebook page Troll Finder General, V. McQuinnon, who's an old friend of mine from the past 30 plus years, has now got the title of Danza's Rottweiler because this week he went into action and put the boot in mightily on my behalf. And I'll tell you more about it after the credits. Now that's what I call enigmatic. I really like the old credits. I'm sure many of you will have noticed by now that both my own personal Wikipedia page and the CFZ Wikipedia page have been taken down. This is part of what does appear to be a concerted attack on cryptozoology by personal persons unknown. And the biggest criticism that they make against cryptozoology in general and the CFZ in particular is that it is pseudoscience and that cryptozoologists make extraordinary and unverifiable claims. Well over the years I can only think of four or five claims I've made and at least three of them have turned out to be true. For example, look at this. This is a pine martin. It is one of the rarest British carnivores and an incredibly beautiful animal. And about 30 years ago I was working on a book which turned out eventually to become Smaller Mystery Carnivores of the West Country when I came across evidence that there were pine martins still in the New Forest. So I've included this in my research and I presented this evidence to Daphne Hills who was 
the curator of mammals, I believe, at the time at the British Museum of Natural History. And I also took it to people from the Mammal Society, from English Nature and all sorts of other people whom you would have thought would have been very interested in the idea that Britain's rarest carnivore was still to be found holding on in there in the places where it had been thought to have been extinct for half decades. But they were uniformly not interested and several of them were quite rude to me, calling me a fantasist and treating it as if I had claimed that a herd of mammoths or Siberian tigers were to be seen crossing the serpentine. I'm quite used to people being rude to me in my line of work and so, although I'm not going to say it went off like water off a duck's back, I was actually quite hurt because I was proud of my research and still am. But I decided that a prophet was without honour in his own land and I went off and went on with my business. This week, guess what happened? Yes, English nature and various other news outlets have all announced that pine mountains have been found. Where? Yep, you've guessed it, in the new forest. Have a gander at this. Well, I felt slightly smug about the whole affair, but I wasn't going to do anything about it. You see, about 20 years ago, when it was discovered that there was a population of European western green lizards, living in the hills above Bournemouth, exactly where I had predicted that they would be found, I made the mistake of going, Ha ha, told you so! Well, I thought it was funny. Darren Nash and various other members of the academic community who are still on speaking terms with me didn't and told me that this is really not the behaviour of somebody who wanted to be taken seriously within the zoological community. So this time, despite the fact that, ha ha, I told you so, there were pine martins in the new forest, I didn't say it. And I just sat back feeling smug and waited for the world to carry on and move on to whatever was going to happen next. And then, totally to my surprise, and I must admit, quite a lot of gratification, over the hill rode Downs' Rottweiler. Um, okay, I'm a bit apologetic here because I've mixed my metaphors. I don't think that um, a Rottweiler can ride over the hill, but if they could have done, he would have looked like this, I'm sure. And V, God bless him, came to my defence against the people who 30 years ago had decided with a knee-jerk reaction that because I had self-identified as a cryptozoologist, I must obviously be a nut job who believes in any old rubbish. And then other people, including, I believe, Nigel Wright, came to my defence as well. And there seemed to be, for five minutes, which is an awful long time on Facebook, a whole backlash against those people who had dared to um, not believe what I said all those years ago. Well, it wasn't the fact that they didn't agree with what I said or didn't believe what I said. It was the fact they were so bloody rude about it that annoyed me and annoys me still. But hey-ho. <laughs> I recently learned about a Japanese media franchise called Kimono Friends. It was originally a free-to-play mobile game, then it became a manga and now it's an anime TV series with a broadly ecological and conservationist message. Something that I found particularly peculiar about this game is that one of the characters is an anthropomorphized version of an animal which has fascinated me for many years, 
possibly the most enigmatic wildcat species known to science. The island of Irimoti is a small remote island that is part of a chain of islands owned by Japan that is to the southwest of Okinawa, which is the, the southernmost of the large islands in Japan. And on that island is a species of wild cat, the Irimoti cat. And it wasn't discovered until 1965. It's about the size of a, a Scottish wild cat. And it's related to the Indian leopard cat, which is a widespread small cat on mainland Asia. And the Irimoti cat remained completely undiscovered until the mid 60s. And it preys mainly on a small species of pygmy hog that you also get on this island. And uh, the, the actual island itself, Irimoti, I think there's only one road on it. Um, there's very, very few people live on it. And it's 90% jungle and mangrove which is fascinating. It's a, one of those places I'd love to go. I have what Alan Wicker called islanditis. I love to go to little island places. There's, a, there's a, another Japanese island that's, that's got a, a species of mole on it and that's uh, known from one type specimen. And this island is even smaller. It's only a couple of miles across. I would love to go to that island and look for this mystery mole. And I'd love to go to Irimoti because as well as the Irimoti cat, which would be wonderful to see in itself, there's a second mystery cat on uh, Irimoti, uh, which is which is um, even larger. It's about the size of a um, clouded leopard. And this cat is reported to to have a, either striped or spotted page. It's a size that's it's about two to two and a half meters long, including the long tail, which makes it the size of a, a of a clouded leopard. And it's completely unknown to science. And it's probably another species. Of, of the clouded leopard, another, rather, rather another subspecies or race of the clouded leopard. But on this tiny, virtually uninhabited island, there's a big cat that nobody knows about. I mean, it, they're, they're sightings by the islanders are reported regularly, but no one has confirmed it. No one's gone there really to look for it. It would make a smashing documentary if, you, if we went over uh, and tried to find a, or film this animal, because it's absolutely fascinating. And once again it's Sunday morning and Richard and I are sitting talking about books. And I managed to get rid of the crumbs that were in my beard from the last segment. So, what are we going to be reading today, Richard? Mysterious America by Lowen Coleman, the revised edition. Well, the original edition is one of my favourite, favourite 14 books. And I think that in writing it, Lauren became one of the pivotal people who introduced me to what Sportiana was all about. I discovered Mysterious America roughly at the same time as I discovered Monstrum by Doc Shields and... Um, Disneyland of the Gods by John Keel and those three books totally turned my world upside down but it has to be said I don't like the um, revised edition as much as the original what do you think Rich? well I, I got the original when it first came out and it was an incredibly influential book to me I, re I read it way before I read um, On a Track of Unknown Animals because On the Track of Unknown Animals was very hard to get hold of. So I read both um, Mysterious America and Curious Encounters before I read any of Heuvelman's books. And what you get from reading this is that Lauren Coleman had really put in the groundwork. He had travelled around, all around the States, investigating these cases. And it, it reminds me very much of Tony Healy. He's like an American version of Tony Healy in that he went out and did the work. He didn't just sit at home theorising. He went and investigated these cases. And in the book he goes all over the States looking at late monsters, spook lights, the Kentucky goblins, uh, Bigfoot sightings, skunk apes, 
giant catfish. There's this one else, a, a giant catfish on the on the curve. Devil monkeys, not just cryptozoology, but all sorts of Fortiana. Um, sort of like a, the real life X Files, only better and before. Uh, it's a tremendously good book. Uh, a wonderful read, well written as well as well researched, it's very engagingly written. You could have the most interesting subject in the world, and if you're not a good writer, it won't show. But uh, it's well written, it's gripping, it's insightful, and uh, I would say it's an iconic um, Fortean book. One of the chapters I like most in the original edition, I don't think is in this edition, but it was people who had actually claimed sightings of the three Nephites, who are characters from the Book of Mormon. And I'm not a Mormon, very much not a Mormon. I was involved for a time, about 15 years, 15, 16, oh golly, 17 years ago now, I was involved with a lady who was a Mormon, and so I went to her church with her a few times. I met some of the elders of the church, and it was the nearest that I've ever felt like of being in a cult. But I am interested how the iconography of Mormonism works. It's supposed to be a new scripture for the new world. And the idea that three ancient Hebrew characters who managed to come from pre, pre-Christ Near East to North America and appear to be um, immortal. The fact that people actually claim to see the three Nephites and some of the accounts that I've met, I've discovered, are not even from Mormons, just from people who know a little bit about the Mormon religion, like me. And I find that absolutely fascinating even though it's got absolutely nothing to do with cryptozoology. But it's an absolutely fantastic book. I do think that the first edition pips the second edition at the post, but that's probably being unfair. There are all sorts of reasons why the second edition is slightly different. And, hey, I've done that myself. I've revised my writings when it comes to a new edition. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And as the ghost of Joe Strammer, who is a regular visit to the studio, wants me to remind you, always remember to ring the notification bell. Otherwise, you won't be told when we've got a new show available. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and anybody who self-identifies as anything outside those categories, I think we've come to the end of the show for this time. I hope you've enjoyed it. I find it as always, great fun to put together and very interesting. I hope that you've learnt stuff as well, because I certainly have. And I really enjoy doing these shows. It's the high spot of my life these days. And I'm very, very glad that you guys out there in viewership land do appear to enjoy what we do here. So a big thank you to everybody without whom this episode could not have been put together. Graham, Carl, Richard and Louis. And behind the scenes, Charlotte, Maxine and Sarah, who have all been absolutely wonderful. I want to say a big thank you to all of you. I want to say a big thank you to our Patreons. And I'm really going to have to start 
telling everybody when we have a new patron. I think I'm going to start doing that very soon. So, on the track is, as always, an ever-evolving process. I hope you enjoy being part of it, because I certainly do. Now, this episode may be over, but we only have another seven days to go, because in seven days' time, it'll be Saturday afternoon, and Saturday afternoon, it's on the track time. I'm going to be there. Are you going to be there? Because if you're there, and I'm there, I'll be seeing you.